You are listening to the Prepared Warrior Podcast, where law enforcement and military trainers discuss cutting-edge training, tactics, and technology. Here is your host, John Wilson. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 10 of the Prepared Warrior. I'm John Wilson. Our guest for this episode is Kevin Michalowski. I like to start every episode with a quote. This one is from Brian Stewart Germain, who said, Your body cannot go where your mind has not been. All right, we got a very special guest on the program today, Kevin Michalowski. He's the executive editor of Concealed Carry magazine, published by the United States Concealed Carry Association, also a police officer in Wisconsin. Thanks so much for speaking with me today, Kevin. I'm really happy to be here, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate that. Now, first, uh, could you tell us uh, what the USCCA does and how you first became involved? Well, the the United States Concealed Carry Association uh, provides education, training, and legal protection for responsibly armed citizens. So um, through our association, uh, our members, like I said, they they get uh, training, they get education about what it means to carry a concealed pistol and the responsibilities that go along with that. And then legal protection if they're ever involved in a deadly force incident or something like that. We help them find an attorney and uh, and help them uh, uh, work their way through the legal system just to make sure that that, that worst day of their life doesn't uh, roll on for a couple of years. So I, uh, I got involved about six years ago. I was uh, working for a magazine called Gun Digest at the time. And... Uh, um, the United States Concealed Carry Association was on the cusp of some real growth, and uh, they were looking for someone to uh, basically upgrade and improve Concealed Carry magazine. When I took over the magazine, we had 48,000 readers, and now six years later, we're um, right on a, right on the bubble of 300,000. So um, wow. growth has been phenomenal. Uh, we, we think we're doing the right thing, and uh, along with that uh, publishing of the magazine came uh, – the creation of content in all sorts of other areas, uh, including a lot of video content and a lot of uh, scenario-based training and things like that, just to help our members figure out what they should be doing if something goes wrong. Yeah, so you have this video series you produce uh, called The Proving Ground, and you put uh, regular people in these um, these life-or-death situations. How did how did it get started? Well, we were, uh, we were looking around to try to figure out how we can carry scenario-based training because it's something that we do a lot in the police forces here in uh, in Wisconsin. So uh, I work for a very small uh, municipality. We only have five sworn officers, but in our county, we have uh, seven different police agencies. So we all get together and we will conduct training um, with larger groups of officers. And I wanted to bring scenario-based training to our members. And the only way to do that was to do it on video. So we put together the original idea was to do a fight train fight scenario where we would take a person who has a concealed carry permit and maybe a little bit of experience and they they think they know what they're doing and just drop them into a scenario and see what they do and then we would uh, would capture that with as many cameras as we could and review what they did and then give them give them some ideas as what they could do better and then drop them into a similar scenario and see if they if they learned their lessons so to speak so it, uh, it has proven to work very well. We've done, uh, I, I believe, 14 of these three-part series now, and uh, we've aired 13 of them. Uh, the next one will be coming out in April. So it's, it's going very, very well, and we're getting lots of great comments from that. And uh, um, quite honestly, I'd like to thank the folks up at SETCAN because when I was looking to do scenario-based training – I didn't want to use, you know, simunitions or something of that sort where we would be covering up people's faces and not be able to hear the inflection in their voices. So we uh, we settled on the stress vest system, and uh, you guys really helped us out a lot with uh, helping to make our scenario-based training better and uh, and talking to some of your experts and and using your equipment involved in this. We uh, we get lots of positive comments now on what we're doing, and I think the last time through we had. Uh, um, up to 15,000 unique visitors who are watching the entire episode of what we did. Wow. Yeah, I know it's really well produced. Um, so, so I understand why, why so many people, um, you know, are into it and are watching it and, and it's really like interesting seeing how people react in those scenarios. Um, can you give people examples of what the, the different scenarios that you put these, uh, these people into? 
Well, we've gone uh, everything uh, we, um, from a, a simple um, attempted robbery up to um, the most recent one we finished was a, a large scale um, uh, active mass murder event uh, filmed inside a church. So um, we, we started small because quite honestly, we didn't know what we were doing at the time and we were working our way through it and we wanted to see what we could do to make it better each and every time. So we uh, um, we just turned our TV studio here into a uh, what looked like an underground parking garage and uh, outfitted our trainee with uh, um, a uh, Glock pistol set up with the uh, the stress vest system and uh, and marched him off to go get in his car and then we just had an attacker come out and attack him and uh, that was a very simple operation but just based on the reaction we got from thousands and thousands of viewers. Uh, we decided to uh, to just continue to upgrade everything uh, everything about the Proving Ground series um, to the point where we have uh, rented a convenience store and staged a convenience store robbery. We've staged a carjacking at a gas pump. Um, we've uh, staged a uh, robbery inside a coffee shop. Um, it just uh, it like. Like you said, um, the production value just keeps going up and up. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the hard part now is finding something bigger and better to do every single time. What would you say are the most important things people learn from the scenario training that they can't get from like static exercises? The most important thing that everybody talks about is how quickly things happen. Even if we intentionally tell the role players to slow down, the trainees do not understand until they're involved how quickly things happen and how much ground a role player can cover or or what is what is going on all around the entire situation uh, because we always throw in a, a couple extra um, role players to either uh, throw people off the scent so to speak or just create confusion because in any sort of situation you're going to be um, there's going to be other people moving around and there's going to be some confusion about what's happening yeah and how do you manage the having so many role players in the scenarios, I, I imagine it's, you know, there's a lot of preparation involved uh, in to, to get people um, reacting in certain ways, right? Right. We've started uh, um, the, the entire process. We started by scripting um, as much as we could in the beginning. Um, obviously the trainee um, has, uh, has no script. And, and basically what we do um, at the opening is tell the trainee, here's what you're faced with. Um, you, you know, um, the very first one was, uh, you've been shopping for your wife and here you go. Um, you're coming out of the store and this is the bag of stuff that you bought for your wife's birthday. Now go get in your car and just deal with whatever happens. And then we just give the role players, um, the who role players really guide all of the action in a scenario based training operation. So we give the role players some very specific, um, uh, guidelines and, and things that they're supposed to do and things that they're specifically not supposed to do. And we let the role players sort of push the action um, from one point to another. In, in our most recent uh, um, filming episode that we did out here, we, uh, we had uh, um, our trainees were, uh, were people who were camping in a recreational vehicle. And our role players approached um, the RV and decided to rob them outside the RV. And one of the things that had happened was we did some interviews prior to this filming and our, our trainees said, well, they stored their guns inside a locked safe in their RV. So we had them do that. And it really brought to light the difficulty of what would happen if you had to get inside your RV to get your firearm to try to defend against a knife attack that was going on outside. And our role player actually opened the safe, took his own gun out and came out to engage the, uh, the uh, attacker and left the safe open with his wife's gun inside, and the attacker was able to get inside the RV and get a hold of that gun. So it was a it was a, a pretty good educational moment for the 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 trainees in that situation. What other kind of lessons do people learn? Maybe that they didn't expect. Um, you know, after they go through the scenario once, and then then you teach them, and then they go through the scenario, you know, a second time. Um, really, uh, we're focusing on movement a lot. Um, telling people not to stand still. Um, and you can see that in the, in the second scenario, after the training, um, the idea that they will commit to some sort of movement is really ingrained in their head. Um, and it started with the very first scenario. Our, our role player um, came out and the trainee stood still and put his hands up and did absolutely nothing. And with just a half an hour of training, we were able to teach Phil that, hey, if a guy shows up with a gun, move to cover immediately. And, uh, and Phil uh, bought into that uh, situation wonderfully and 
by the by the second scenario, which was just filmed the very next day, um, Phil was moving and shooting and communicating effectively. He was doing all of the things that you're supposed to do when you're involved in a fight. But quite frankly, he'd never had that training before. He got his concealed carry permit, and he thought he was going to be okay. And it was really eye-opening to him um, that he needed to be moving and how dynamic the situation would be. What do you think is the best way for a person to have uh, confidence handling a firearm in, in a stressful situation? And without without scenario based training, you're basically teaching marksmanship. Um, I I would encourage people to go anywhere they could to uh, get involved in in some level of scenario based training. And when I say anywhere they could, I'm you know obviously you want to uh, you do some research and and make sure that you're going to a um, a qualified trainer who is, is doing things safely and has been certified by whatever agency that uh, um, they're working with or, or whatever gear that they're working with. But uh, the, the simple idea that uh, you, you think you're going to put a gun on your hip and, uh, and pull it out when you need it and everything will be fine um, seems to be lost on, on a lot of people when, the, when they go through scenario-based training. What we always tell them is that you're not going to rise to the occasion. You're going to fall back to that lowest level of training you had. So if if no one ever taught you how to move and shoot, you're never going to be able to do it effectively. And you will. Uh, um, we can see it in people's faces. That's why I love using the stress vest because I just watch their faces on camera as they get confused. And you see them go through this progression of what is happening. This is not happening. Oh, yes, it's really happening. I need to do something now. And that might take them – only three seconds, but three seconds is a very long time if someone's charging at you with a knife or pulling a gun out to shoot at you. Yeah, and that and that kind of reaction can can not just happen with you know regular civilians, but even uh, trained officers um, when something happens suddenly, and uh, and that's uh, you know it's not usual for I guess civilians to to do a lot of scenario based training because um, normally it's developed for law enforcement. So what would you say is like the the biggest difference developing scenario training? Um, for for the average person, when it's normally developed for law enforcement, that's the, the background you come from. And and what we've had to do is very clearly um, provide instruction, especially going into the second scenario, that it's okay to just leave the area. Okay, mm-hmm. um, we're teaching civilians that um, you know situational awareness and conflict avoidance are the two key elements to self defense. Whereas we teach police officers to run to the sound of the gunfire take over the situation, engage the target, um, neutralize the target, and then control the situation uh, for everything from evidence to making sure nobody else gets hurt. When we're dealing with civilians, we want those civilians to look for escape routes, quite frankly. That's the first thing we teach them is when you walk into a room, figure out where the exits are so you can get out of there safely. And it's uh, um, especially in the second scenario, um, during the training sequences of the proving ground, We teach them, you know, I'll ask questions. Hey, did you even look for an escape route or an exit sign or something like that while we were running the first scenario? And um, some of them have picked it up pretty quickly and some of them have just focused on the danger and forgotten that they need to get themselves out of the area. So uh, the the big focus on scenario-based training for civilians is this conflict avoidance portion of what we're doing. And you know, when the gun comes out, start moving, but immediately start moving toward cover and to an escape route. And once we do that, um, I <laughs> I laugh sometimes because in uh, in putting together 14 different scenarios over the past year and a half, um, we have never been able to accurately predict what a trainee will do. We try to go through the entire list so that we can get cameras in the right spots to catch them and, and see what they're doing. And we have, they've come up with something different for us every single time and we're, and we're kind of... Uh, caught off guard and, and making sure that the cameramen are following them properly and stuff like that. But now that more and more people are watching, more and more of our trainees are coming to us with the idea that, oh, I'm going to have to get out of here some way, aren't I? And and that's exactly it. We want people to avoid that fight and only use force if it's the last resort. Yeah, you mentioned your camera people and you have such a great media production team recording these scenarios. How is How important is it to have all this video to review afterwards? And that's uh, probably one of the uh, the best things that we have done for our USCCA members or anybody who's watching uh, the Proving Ground is uh, not only do we capture, I, I think we're up to 16 cameras now on the, the Proving Ground 
um, video production crew that we're using. We capture it from 16 different angles, but then we will go back after the initial scenario is over and we will recreate some things as, as cinematic shots, um, showing people not only what happened from a different point of view, but then we run a, a what if scenario, you know, what if you tripped over something at your campsite or what if the door was locked and you couldn't get out that direction. And that, when we do our live training broadcast uh, at the end of the uh, the three-part series, we let our viewers ask us questions. And uh, we have myself, uh, one of the trainees, and an attorney on hand um, for a live broadcast to just ask questions about the, the legal and tactical aspects of what's going on. How hard is it for people to know, um, I guess, how they're legally protected, uh, especially in the U.S., because the, the states are, are very different from each other, right, on the on the legal um, requirements, uh, you know, to, to be able to carry, right? Yeah, yes, and that's one thing that we really have to stress as a, as a nationwide organization here in the U.S., um, we have 50 different state laws. Um, all of them are different. All of them have different requirements for, um, some states have requirements to retreat. Some states have a, a stand your ground law or a castle doctrine law. And we just have to really f um, remind everybody that if you're carrying a gun, you need to know the laws in your jurisdiction. And that's your responsibility. Um, we can't be expected to um, keep up to date on every single one. We do the best we can, but sometimes it, you know, we'll come up a little bit short. State laws can change, um, you know, every year or in the mid-year or, or whenever a state legislature decides they're going to um, to pass a new law and, and implement it. So um, the uh, the responsibility, and it is a huge responsibility to carry a gun for self-defense. The responsibility falls on the individual to do everything correctly, and that's why we come back to the the conflict avoidance portion of this. You know, get out of there. Um, it, the best fight is the fight you're not in. And, and if you can find an escape route, when things start to escalate, escape immediately. And that's what we're teaching people um, at every element of what we're doing. Right. It's a, that, I guess that's the hardest part for someone to judge um, when they can escape and when they can't escape, right? Right. And, uh, um, you know, our, su our suggestion is always to err on the side of of getting out of there too early. You know, we, uh, um, a couple of different scenarios that we put together, uh, we, we ended up asking people, you know, why did you even engage in this fight? And um, we found out that, well, they, they came to the proving ground assuming that it was going to be a gunfight. Right. Um, you know, because we had, we had the gear and everything was put together. And I said, well, no, um, now you're facing legal actions. And that's why we have an attorney with us uh, during our live broadcast. You know, you made this mistake. Now you're facing the legal consequences of this. And if this was a real real life situation, um, you would probably be going to jail or at very least be the subject of a criminal investigation, if not a civil suit later on. So um, we're trying to give as much information as possible to as many people as possible. Um, but, you know, through the, the video presentations and, and showing them basically what not to do. You know, you've heard that all the time. Um, you the in, it, soldiers in combat stay alive because they learn what not to do. And I, I really believe that's true of uh, people involved in concealed carry as well. You, you have to uh, make these mistakes in a training environment so that you don't make them uh, once something really goes bad. Now, you use the, uh, the stress vests in your uh, training uh, in, the, in these scenarios. Um, what is what is the reaction from from people? Because normally uh, it's just uh, law enforcement that uses this for training. But uh, what's the reaction from people when they when they they get the shock from the stress test? <laughs> um, it, it's always uh, uh, that's one of the things that we do uh, immediately is is bringing people involved um, in the these scenarios and uh, we inoculate them uh, with a, a a pulse from the vest to let them know what they're going to be facing if they make a mistake. And uh, that seems to get everybody's attention almost immediately. And uh, we have had a couple of people who, who have been so supercharged on adrenaline, even in a training scenario, that they didn't immediately feel the, the first impulse from the vest. So the, uh, the injured officer uh, setting on the vest has been wonderful because um, that, that sort of keeps things going a, a few seconds longer to let people realize that, hey, um, they've made a mistake, they've been hit somewhere, and uh, and they need to uh, deal with that situation. Uh, there's a video uh, we have of you online last year uh, trying out the the arm shocker. Um, have you ever thought of uh, implementing that in any of the scenarios? 
Um, no, just because it hurt so badly at the shot show that yeah. uh, I'm terrified of the arm shocker now. Uh, that was uh, um, that that was probably one of the most um, um, intense uh, experiences I've had in, and it wasn't really in a, in a true training environment. It was in a testing environment, but um, that is certainly a piece of gear that will uh, will remind anybody who's using it. That you know um, the the consequences of getting injured and the consequences of uh, of failing to you know keep your arm in the right place in this instant it definitely lets you know what's going on. That was uh, um, everybody got a good laugh of me uh, dancing yeah. around with that arm shocker on. The USACA uh, offers lots of uh, uh, other training kind of videos. Uh, can you tell me about uh, the other the other kind of regular you know videos you produce uh, with regards to firearm training? Yeah, we, uh, um, I produce a weekly video blog called Into the Fray, um, which discusses uh, basically all aspects of, of personal defense, from the legal aspects to uh, preparation to gear that you might carry. Uh, our training department also uh, uh, produces our, our training curriculum, which is, wow, um, it's growing all the time. I, I don't even know if I have uh, everything memorized. We have our, our concealed carry and home defense fundamentals curriculum, um, which is it, just what it sounds like. And uh, we also have a, a women's only curriculum, which helps women get started with concealed carry. We have an individual first aid curriculum. All of those are supported by videos um, in some way, shape, or form. And uh, we, uh, we have produced uh, several um, DVD series, um, some with Dave Young, advanced gunfighting techniques and, uh, and things like that. And George Harris has uh, come on board and helped us out with uh, um, pistol marksmanship techniques and um, Anthony Lambert is uh, um, he is a retired uh, Navy hospital corpsman uh, who served uh, uh, a long time in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He's uh, he's been our first aid subject matter expert, and pretty much everything that we do so far um, in in our training element is supported by video in some way, shape, or form. So uh, you mentioned um, uh, in the proving ground you you had. Uh a scenario at a campground is that, is that one of the newest ones or, or what other places are you are you kind of looking for for doing uh, another scenario series yeah uh, the one that we most recently aired to the public was uh, was uh, filmed in a church and uh, um, the the timing um, for better or for worse uh, um, uh, was was almost perfect um, with public interest on that because it, it followed up the tragic events um, in uh, uh, Thousand Oaks and uh, um, Pittsburgh and right. things like that and in dealing with an active shooter situation um, but we have uh, um, the the uh, training of the, at the campsite and the RV um, we've uh, filmed that and that's in editing process right now and, and will come out this spring um, for use there like I said we we've uh, worked at uh, a, a convenience store and a gas station and a coffee shop and I will probably be uh, looking around for a, a bank robbery scenario in the future. Um, basically, what I look for is uh, is surveillance video of real life situations, and and we try to mimic them as best we can, so that we can, you know, the the catch line on the video is uh, making training as real as possible. So I look around for situations that have actually happened and see how we can bring them to life on camera. Now, as a police officer yourself, why do you think uh, concealed carry rights are uh, uh, good for the public? You know, as a police officer, we can't be everywhere. Um, and, and I, you know, I've had, uh, I, I can give you a, a, a very specific example. Um, I, I work in rural Wisconsin, and, and we live in a very small town. And like I said, we have five sworn police officers. So I'm the only person who's on duty in this town. And uh, when I'm when I'm running a duty shift, and I waited 11 and a half minutes on uh, the day after Thanksgiving on Black Friday, uh, just for an ambulance to arrive uh, to a very serious situation. Police officers can't be there all the time. Um, the way we like to say it is, you are your own first responder. You have to be able to make the right choices and do what you need to do to be able to protect yourself. And I'm counting on the people who have gone through training, got a permit. You know, bought the pistol and, and are involved in protecting their family, I'm counting on them to do the right things. Those are not the criminals. Um, I really tell people all the time that we have to make sure that people know the difference between criminal behavior and non-criminal behavior. It's not We can't just lump gun violence into into one bucket. There's, there's a couple of different things going on there. So um, 
by and large, the people who carry guns and uh, get their concealed carry permits in in uh, the United States are some of the most law-abiding and responsible people out there. Sure, there is occasionally mistakes that are made, and you know what? We chastise those folks as best we can, and I really think that everybody should be held personally responsible for the mistakes that they make with their firearms so they don't make mistakes. Um, people need to know that. But, uh, you know, I have... I've never had any trouble on a traffic stop with somebody who had a concealed carry permit. On the other hand, I have had trouble on a traffic stop with somebody who said, no, there's no drugs or guns in the car. You don't need to worry about me, officer. So um, there's a big difference between those two groups of people. All right, Kevin, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, speak with us today. And I look forward to, you know, all the, the awesome videos in the future. Well, thank you very much, and I, I truly appreciate the help that uh, Set Can has provided. And uh, we're reading your book and and uh, using your gear, and uh, we're just going to keep getting bigger and better every time. This has been the Prepared Warrior Podcast. For more info on our guests or other episodes, check out thepreparedwarrior.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the Prepared Warrior Podcast, email J-O-N at theprepared warrior.com.